We are honored to have as our moderator for this session an internationally recognized scholar in the areas of federalism and decentralization, conflict resolution, and democratization. He is the academic head of the International Research and Consulting Center at the Institute of Federalism, University of Freiburg. Before joining the IRCC, he led the politics and international relations program at Canterbury Christ Church University, United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Kyle Soren. Thank you very much. Wow, what an entrance. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody from Switzerland. Um, it is 7.30 here, so it is reasonably early here, although, as you will see, one of our speakers is from the United Kingdom. Um, it's even earlier for him. So um, I, I am optimistic that it's not the earliest for me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, hello to everybody wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this fantastic round table on managing the pandemic under uh, federal structures. Uh, we have a fantastic panel today. Um, we have uh, four yeah. speakers with us. Um, it's really great opportunity. They will talk about different countries, different experiences. Before I introduce our, uh, our panel and our speakers, um, let me introduce the topic to you a little bit more from uh, what uh, Professor Sonia just said. Um, obviously, the pandemic was a watershed for the whole world. This idea, many of us uh, three, four years ago would not believe that things like lockdowns would happen, that we would be asked to stay at home, that we would see uh, big cities all across the world being completely empty. Um, the pandemic, COVID-19, in the first place, of course, is a health issue. It's a question, it's a virus, um, it's a question of how do a health systems cope with it, um, and that has many different layers, from the immediate response of uh, how do you uh, limit the spread of infections, to the development of vaccines, the spread of vaccines, the ongoing questions about booster vaccines, um, that is a health fight. Uh, we will not particularly talk about this today because this is not a, a panel of medical experts. What we will talk about is the other side to COVID-19, is the effect that COVID-19 had on questions of democracy. What do you do when all of a sudden parliaments can't meet anymore? Um, what do you do when in a country like the one where I live, referendums can't take place? You can't go out to collect signatures for public initiatives. Uh, political parties can't meet. Elections have to be delayed in many countries. Um, fundamental questions for democracy were raised. Fundamental questions about human and fundamental rights were raised. What do you do when your government tells you you have to stay at home? You have to close your business, right? You can't have any contact with your family, right? So um, deep-rooted questions um, that... Um, continue to have a, a, a knock-on effect about the situation of human and fundamental rights in many countries. Uh, COVID-19 had a fundamental effect on the rule of law. When you, many countries, revert to emergency legislation, how do we ensure that courts can still check the legality of decisions if they are taken by emergencies? if they are not scrutinized properly, if they are implemented very quickly. And of course, we have a whole dimension of economic and social issues. When you lock your economy down, you cannot just tell people you have to close your shop. You have to offer them some financial incentive. We will hear about the case of India. What do you do when you have millions of workers who work in one part of the country who all of a sudden are being told, go home. What consequences does that have? When we talk about federal and decentralized systems, of course, we get an additional dimension to this. We get the form of multi-level governance. We get different layers of government, from the local to the regional and to the national government, that deal with these issues. 
Most often in federal states, we found that crisis management and dealing with many of the aspects I just mentioned were actually shared competences or concurrent competences. So therefore, there was not only a question of who is in charge of what, but also how can coordination be ensured. That will be at the heart of the discussion we will have this uh, morning. Um, the question of how did federal structures affect crisis response, but also how did crisis management engage with federal structures? What intergovernmental cooperation did we see? What worked particularly well? But also what did not work well at all and what lessons are learned? And of course, as Professor Sonia has mentioned, uh, we need to look at it today as well. The global pandemic is not over. The virus is still with us. We are probably all a bit more relaxed because a lot of people are vaccinated. Uh, the virus seems to have mutated to a less dangerous variant. But most experts tell us that by no way can we be sure this is over and the virus won't come back with a vengeance. So um, therefore looking at, well, have federal systems become more robust? Have we learned lessons? or are there still ongoing issues and problems, um, seems to me to become really, really important. What is important for me for our roundtable today is um, that um, before introducing our participants, um, I will only ask two questions to each of the participants, and then I invite all of you in the audience to ask questions. The idea of this roundtable is really giving you a chance as well to ask the experts that we have here today questions about how federalism affected crisis management, how intergovernmental relations developed, and how system changed and adapted to federal structures. That is enough for me. Please allow me now to introduce um, our fantastic panel we have today. We have four excellent speakers from different parts of the world. Um, I will uh, um, introduce them in order that they are listed in the program. Um, I'm very glad he's here with us this morning. Is Professor Shanshal Kumar Sharma. Uh, Professor Shanshal works at the Central <coughs> University of Haryana in India. I'm very glad that Shanshal is with us this morning. Uh, he is one of the leading experts on Indian federalism, and he too has done quite an extensive amount of research on looking at how has India dealt with the pandemic and how has uh, Indian federalism um, coped with the challenges that the pandemic uh, threw at its institutional, legal, and constitutional framework. Um, so let me start with my with my first question, so we can start the discussion. First of all, uh, my first question that I really would like to ask is is kind of the essence of the crisis. When Shanshal, uh, let me let me come to you. Uh, for India, a pandemic like this must have been a major issue and a major challenge. Uh, what is your assessment about um, how the crisis management worked? What would you say worked well? What did you say were some of the problems? And would you say that the intergovernmental uh, interactions and relations uh, did what they were meant to do? Or were there clear visible tensions and problems that, for example, Paul pointed out in the case of the UK? Uh, it needs to be uh, understood uh, that the Constitution of India, while specifying the functional role of the units, does not subserve the doctrinaire idea of their inherent autonomy. Our constitution blends federal features with strong central control. In India, the second chamber, whose powers are subordinate to the lower house, that is the house of people, is, is, is not designed to act as a hub of the aspirations of the states. On the other hand, the partisan logic of collective action afflicts our intergovernmental forums whether it is the constitutionally mandated interstate council, which even otherwise uh, is in a state of terminal decline, 
or the governing council of the Niti Aayog, which is a non-statutory body. This partisan logic of collective action weakens the effectiveness of intergovernmental forums as institutions of shared rule, collaboration, and coordination. When the pandemic struck India, the biggest challenge was to prevent India's poor healthcare system from being overburdened. The challenge was to quickly ramp up the supply of pads, vaccines, ventilators, and other critical care equipments across the country. The challenge here was not just financial, but also political. Because achieving these objectives required a very high degree of vertical and horizontal uh, coordination uh, among uh, government departments and agencies and among different actors at all three levels. Achieving such coordination and collaboration has been possible in countries where the uh, federal culture supports ideologies of integrationism, for example, Germany, or non-centralism, for example, Canada, where the units enjoy a high degree of self-rule. However, achieving coordination proved to be a big challenge in India because the unitarist and centrist ruling party at the center adopted unilateral measures especially during the first wave, and fend for yourself approach during the second wave in an environment that was badly strained by partisan polarization among states and across the nation. So when the pandemic started hitting off in early 2020, the ruling party at the center adopted a very centralized approach to address the crisis. While several, several uh, countries in South Asia implemented partial and smart lockdown measures. India imposed one of the world's strictest lockdowns, which was announced unilaterally without any prior consultations or planning. This unplanned lockdown resulted in serious economic uh, disruptions and triggered a huge migrant labor crisis. While failing to contain the spread of virus, overall, the immediate challenges were to devise appropriate lockdown strategies, to protect life, safeguard livelihood, and to provide, most importantly, food security to poor migrant laborers who had no means to sustain their life while, while remaining indoors. In addition to the three uh, high, in, in addition, there were uh, three high level uh, policy challenges relevant to uh, intergovernmental relations. These were number one, to develop a framework to support local governments because the third tier uh, of government uh, was at the forefront of the war against COVID-19. Number two, to provide economic support to the states uh, because the financial crisis triggered by the pandemic at the state level was much higher than that suffered by the center. And finally, to operationalize a sort of negotiated cooperation to cope with uh, coordination challenges so crucial for a swift uh, policy response to COVID-19 crisis. That's all uh, from my side for this question. Sorry. Thank you. Th thank you very much, um, Shansha. It's really interesting. I apologize if you hear a drill in the background. There seems to be some drilling going on at 10 past 8 in the morning. This is Smith efficiency for you. Um, this is really interesting to hear that you mentioned the centralized response, um, some of the problems with it, and also, of course, one thing that uh, maybe Paul, Johanna, and, and, and Dr. Kim haven't pointed out yet, but of course, which is also very important, is not just the federal interaction, but also the capability on the ground, right? What kind of healthcare system did you have? What kind of challenges were created with that, right? And, and as you mentioned, especially in India, that was a key question. You have a relatively weak healthcare system and one that's also different depending on where you are in India. Right? Um, and then how do you prevent that from overburdening? Now, the best healthcare systems in the world ask themselves exactly the same question, right? How do we prevent our healthcare system in Switzerland, in the US, in Germany, right, from being overwhelmed? And these are some of the best funded systems in the world. So if you then have a system that's maybe not as strongly funded, a lot of interesting questions come up. Now, before I uh, open the floor up to our audience, um, and I know you will have many questions, uh, I would like to ask our speakers one more question, um, and, and I'll ask you for relatively short and precise answers, so we have plenty of time for questions from the audience. 
uh, and maybe we go here in reverse order. So my question is, as, prof uh, as Professor Sonia has mentioned in her opening remarks, I'm interested in two things. Um, so I'm hiding two questions in one and still ask you to be short. Um, the first thing is kind of what would you say are the key lessons learned? What is like where you say, if I look at, at, at my case or my cases, these are one or two key things we have learned from, from the pandemic crisis management. And with that, um, connected to that is my question of stickiness. In other words, have there been any changes or have there been any new forums, any new discussions uh, that, that are staying? Where there is a discussion to say, okay, um, I, I mean, I can give you the example. I'm sure Johanna will, will go into detail. In, in Switzerland, there is at the moment a huge discussion about the role of parliament, right? To say we can't really leave parliament out of pandemic management. So how do we in the future engage parliament? So that's kind of a sticky issue that came up because parliament was left out. And um, that kind of will be around. There will be a new and amended uh, infection management law, a pandemic management law that will give a much stronger, more prominent role to parliament. Uh, and I wonder in the other cases that we have seen where you can see like, yes, this is an emerging debate that will be around and will be really important for 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 the near future uh, or as, is the crisis worth to come back. And um, Chancha, can, can I ask you to kind of give us your assessment of what were key lessons learned and what are these sticky, sticky points when you look at it? Uh, <coughs> Soren, uh, in terms of lessons learned, uh, I think India has to offer both do's as well as don'ts of pandemic management. While uh, central governments in several countries such as Austria, Brazil, Italy, South Africa, Spain, the United States boosted intergovernmental grants to provide financial support to subnational governments during the COVID crisis. The government of India, even during the devastating second wave, did not wake up to the reality that financing is critical for realizing the enormous potential of a decentralized response. The extreme level of fiscal centralization in the name of COVID management was not complemented by any systematic attempt to uh, support uh, the states and the uh, local governments who were at the forefront of the war against COVID-19 but had fewer resources to meet the challenge. Similarly, while central governments in several countries such as Belgium, Canada and Italy have used existing institutions to cope with coordination challenges and several other countries such as Australia, Austria and the United States have created new intergovernmental uh, coordination mechanisms to, uh, uh, to deal with the uh, crisis, the Indian government chose to ignore the calls for reactivating the moribund interstate council by giving it effective administrative powers uh, to deal with the coordination uh, challenges. As a result, during the second wave, we saw the height of the blame game and an attempt to use COVID-19 as a political weapon, which is a stark reminder of the problems that arise when a crisis occurs in a multi-level system afflicted with partisan polarization. As the calamity unfolded, the center completely disappeared from the scene, stating that health was a state subject. This stance then manifested in the states fighting with uh, one another over essential medicines and oxygen cylinders. As the chaos rose to a crescendo, the Supreme Court had to take a sua motor cognizance to resolve center-state and interstate conflicts and contesting claims on vaccination and oxygen supply. Even in this scenario, some states clearly emerged as beacons of pandemic management. My observation is that one important variable here is the quality, capacity and preparedness of the health infrastructure, which varies widely across states. However, a closure look reveals that a good health infrastructure is not enough because we have observed that some states with relatively poor health infrastructure for example Orissa have performed better in in comparison to other states with relatively better infrastructure for instance Karnataka here I see the role of the leadership as a crucial variable 
Indeed, many chief ministers, even in the context of a relatively low health infrastructure, led their states to put up a strong fight against COVID-19. However, I have found that even a combination of good health infrastructure and committed leadership is not enough for successful response unless backed up by certain preconditions or three strong fundamentals of local governance. These are number one, trust and coordination between state government, local governments and civil society organizations. Number two, interdepartmental trust and interministerial coordination. And number three, community-based volunteering or community participation in, in uh, state policies. So, but, but uh, for a complete success though, the center has to play an important role in coordinating the overall strategy while at the same time taking care of the economic costs at the state level and investing in capacity building at the local level. That's from my side, sorry. Thank you very much, Shancha. That's It's really interesting because you didn't so much talk about lessons learned, but more about lessons that still need to be learned. Right? So yes. that, I, I find that really interesting that, I mean, the what I find fascinating about the pandemic is we can talk about all the political structures and coordination, and that's super interesting for us as academics. But of course, COVID-19 had devastating effects for people's lives and, and families and livelihoods, right? And, and then to think about, we are still at the stage where we are thinking about what are some basic lessons that we need to learn from this, right? Um, I, 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 you know, when we, when we take it around this way, I still find very, very fascinating. Let me just ask one question to Shansha. Um, right. I mean, I think one of the of the challenges of federal systems is the need for coordination between different levels. And your argument was that in India this was a key problem. And the question in the chat is that that uh, the participant asked that is baffling in a country like India with a well developed local level, a state level, and and the federal level. Why do you think was there such a failure to coordinate? and to, to come to joint decisions and joint actions. <clears throat> right, right, right. Uh, I identify uh, four uh, causal factors, uh, include uh, number one, a high level of vertical fiscal gap, which results in central state friction on distribution of resources. However, the, uh, the vertical fiscal gap in itself is not an issue. The problem arises when despite having a huge resource advantage over states, the central government displays its reluctance to support subnational levels in difficult times. Second structural factor is the lack of extension of federalism to the third year of government. Here again, I think uh, the unprecedented crisis should have triggered an all hands on the deck approach especially in view of the crucial role of the local governments. But the higher orders of the uh, government, uh, even at uh, the you know, state level as well as at the central level, made no systematic attempt to invest in capacity building at the local level. So what I'm suggesting is that structural factors are no excuse during the times of crisis and the right things could still have been done. So what prevented the administration at the various levels from actually doing the right thing or doing things right? I argue that the culprit lies in, as I said in uh, my response to previous questions as well, the two features of intergovernmental interactions in India. One is the confrontational partisan federalism. Their partisanship is the major basis of center state local interactions. And the second feature is the tendency to shift blame and compete for political credit and recognition. So we clearly observe center's reluctance uh, to provide more fiscal space or independent financial resources to the states. On the other hand, we see states blaming the center for snatching their powers, especially during the first wave, and for shrugging off its responsibility uh, during the second wave. In addition, we see opposition rules uh, ruled states uh, blaming the center for providing support to suit their political alignments. But there were, there, there was, we don't see any attempt by both the levels of government to, to invest in a joint strategy to build capacity at the local level for uh, dealing with the crisis. So these are some of the uh, reasons uh, I can come up with.